All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Welcome to Malvern Books. Uh, tonight we are going to hear what I am sure will be some excellent poetry. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first reader is Simone Mensch. Simone is the author of several books, including Wolf Centos, and her recent collection, Suture, which is a book of sonnets written with Dean Rader. Both of those are available for sale over there on the table. She and Dean also edited They Said, a multi-genre anthology of contemporary collaborative writing. Uh, she's the recipient of such awards as a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and is professor of English at Lewis University, where she teaches creative writing and film studies. Please welcome Simone Mensch. Um, thanks so much to Fernando and Stephanie um, for hosting in this awesome bookstore. Valerie and um, Katie Chrysler, who um, is reading with me. Um, this is an interesting evening. Um, I have some family in the audience. I'm so excited that y'all came. Um, my partner, Richard, and my former professor, Michael, who I knew in Chicago, who's also here. I'm going to read a few pieces. Um, my partner, kept telling me, well, if you're going to meet your dad, maybe you should not read that, and maybe not read that, maybe you should read this. So finally, I was like, just make me a set list, and I'll read whatever you put together. Um, so he put together kind of a strange set list. Uh, it leaps a lot over the course of my work, so I'll read, but I'll probably give little mini intros, because otherwise um, they seem non-contextualized. So I'm going to start, I'm from a very small town, Ginger and I were talking about it, I'm from two very small towns, one Benson and one Iota, but Benson is in northern Louisiana, it's about 50 people, segregated cemetery, it's small. And my whole life I spent trying to escape, not necessarily the small town, but the mindset of the small town, this is called Hex. Trouble came and trouble brought greasy, ungenerous things, poke root and bladder rack, chalk lines and bloody bedrooms and black reptilian bags smelling of acetylene. Trouble came and trouble sang, shush, shush, or tell, tell, for I alone will break your bones as he bedded down for winter in a small, small town smelling of cabbage and tripe where eight black chickens wandered the street. With trouble came clouds agitating the cows, their thick, ruminant bodies clogging up the riverbeds. Trouble came and sang and fish turned belly up. House pets appeared in the well. Children started dying of oddities the small town doctor could not name. Trouble houses, trouble towns, trouble came in 100 waves, in sparks and hexes with horse breath and spiny borders, babies born with club foots and cleft lips, babies born with partial hearts and partial heads, and some just born plain dead. Trouble is and trouble was, and trouble came and sang, shush, shush or tell, tell, in a small, small town. Uh, this is called Eating Olives in the House of Heartbroken Women, and it's probably my, it's about 20 years old, um, and I wrote it for my sister. Eating Olives in the House of Heartbroken Women. My sister leans against the stove, nibbling olives. Like a Rossetti painting, she is pure mischief and melancholy. She is not me, but she is part of me. She is everything and nothing. She is flesh and fault. Part solitude, part social, like an ocean with boats bobbing on it. Her face so sad it breaks plates, the floor littered with pits and tears. We eat Elitzi's, the sweet Crete varietal, atalati, purple, green, and plump, Spanish olives stuffed with pimentos, dragon eyes, we call them, small orbs tasting of oceans and distance, picking olives on the Turkish countryside years ago <coughs> is the closest we've come to religion. 
My sister is backlit from the open window, unaware of her loveliness. The only sound, the chew of fruit. Faith is in small things, she says, passing me the jar that smells of creosote and roses. Outside, the sky spirals in a pink froth. Here we are, her face, my face. In this kitchen, the light has a sharpness that makes our eyes ache as we watch the cat stalk a cardinal across the yard. We are bone and break. There is a country in my stomach as the sun honeycombs through the screen. In this house of heartbroken women, two girls lean into the light spitting pits, learning the difference between sanctuary and salvation. Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems, and they do need sort of a context. I wrote a series called The Orange Girl Suite that was based on this historical figure called The Orange Girl, which I think in Restoration London were these young women, sometimes as young as 12, who would sell oranges in the theaters to keep themselves alive, but it became a euphemism for having to sell themselves to stay alive. And I did an entire series um, using the language of the Oxford English Dictionary as the title. A cause between an orange wife and a forest seller. Hunter, I hand you a red sweater, whisper of precipitation, trigger happy laughter in the light lattice forest. You burn my nightgown to undergrowth in this feral season. Overseer to all small deaths, your lips an orange smear of cordiality. Your rifle's leverage cocks your spine. My skin is soft, the safety's off. The orange girl is generally allowed to enter an auction store, <coughs> for auctioneers are mortal and sometimes eat oranges. I'm stone and pulp like policemen's wives. You're emerald, buried in dark clothes, your eyes leaf bone. Your fingers so many songs out of tune. I have fallen out of trees singing your name. I have fallen into your foliation, into your moth mouth, plum thick tongue. Wherever you are, I'll be white teeth an abandoned <clears throat> town, a wrapped parcel. I'll be a blonde in a black smock with sex appeal, smelling of apiaries. I'll be a cold sea in an old war film. I'll be insubordinate and Seville sweet. You'll be long gone, though you said you'd never leave those poor, crippled orange trees. Um, and this next song, the, the next poem, I was very ill for a period of time. I went through chemo and radiation, um, and in that moment thought I would die. So when I was well, and I am well again, this was my response point to that. And it's a wolf cinto. <clears throat> wolf cinto. I want to be strung up in a strong light and singled out, winnowed from the water and the fire, stalked by the she-wolf, each day to walk the wilderness with its people, its animals, its toil and wind. I want to unfold like Aztec hieroglyphs, to multiply in the glass a transparent gold shirt, exquisite as oranges and leaking muscovado cask, to listen to the metal rattle of the world as if there are gods somewhere, before a vaulting sunrise, hissing salt. A train of cranes outstretched toward alien <coughs> frontiers. I want to know there will be wine on the table. To know the tenderness that gathers over shoulders of wives. An open window, a green river, the language of water. I want everyone to know that I am still alive. And I'm going to switch um, to this book. This is my most recent collaboration. It's a book of sonnets I wrote with a friend, Dean Rader, who teaches at University of San Francisco. 
And it was initially called the Frankenstein Sonnets because we decided to collaborate. I've done a lot of collaborations um, and I love collaborating with other artists, musicians, poets. But Dean and I are both poets and we decided to do these sonnets where we would take the first line from a pre-existing sonnet and then graft our new flesh onto the pre-existing dead flesh, so to speak. So we refer to them as our Frankenstein sonnets. Um, and then, but people kept thinking that it was about the book Frankenstein, so we switched the title to Suture. And so I'll read a few of those sonnets. And this first one, I think it takes its first line from Delmore Schwartz. The beautiful American word, sure. The beautiful American word, sure. As ubiquitous as barbecues and aneurysms. Insure, assure, cocksure, for sure. It drifts through diners, coffee shops, a spawn salmon swimming against itself. The spun waters of language and acquiescence are at both conveyance and hindrance, both hesitation and confirmation, where we are subtracted into shadow and added back as a vowel and added back as echo and a vowel, where the sound sits on our tongue in a drawl of doubt, ringtone of prevarication. You are my you betcha, my no problemo, my lexical promise of obligation. And this one is um, a line from Wordsworth, scorn not the sonnet, critic, you have frowned. Scorn not the sonnet, Critic, you have frowned at its music, damned it as a descent into a rhyming trance, nothing more than the dance of awkward animals. But critic, my mouth will go to you 14 different times in this poem alone. You can peel back my commas, spread my lines, enter any place you'd like, and know this, in this language of drift and erotics, you can't redline the poem's animus without a shift in its voltage from splintered psalm to ferric rot. So the psalm may rot, the brain burn, the music drift. We are still here, critic. You, me, and this sonnet. It's the last line. What's it mean? And I'm going to close with this. and it's Hopkins. I think where from and bound, I wonder where and who and when and which, and I would stitch thunder to air to blue to the wound star of you. I know the sound of clutch and glitch, gash and gone, the scarlet charm of open mouths, rose clouds, I wound. The body's coil spring is both rupture and rapture, a woven sack of loss and plasma, a suturing of sky to skull, of cloud to eye, and I shall ring the loud bell of these bones as one who owns the wings and knows the way to fly beyond this body's sad anatomy. When wind enters me as though closing a door, I am the frame, the flaw, the sky, and the scar. Thank you. Thank you.